Russia, before the revolution, the Russian Empire, was uh, described by Lenin as a jailhouse of nations. <clears throat> according, according to the last uh, Russian census from uh, before the revolution, just 43% of the inhabitants of the Russian Empire were great Russians. And they were concentrated in a few uh, areas. So you have a situation where... Is that it? So you have a situation where the, the dominant national group on which the Tsarist Empire, bureaucracy and so on was based on was not a majority of the population. And, uh, and also a situation where the other oppressed national groups were mainly concentrated in the borderlands. Uh, that is in the north, in the west, where the Russian Empire dominated the Baltic uh, countries, uh, Belarus, Ukraine. In the southwest, in the Caucasus, where there were a whole number of uh, mountain uh, national groups, Georgia. In the, in the whole of the south of, uh, of the Russian uh, Empire, where there were a whole number of other national groups, uh, the Kazakhs and others. And also in the north, in the far east, in the, in the northeast and so on, where there were a whole number of nomadic uh, tribes which you couldn't even describe as national uh, groups, but they had their own uh, identity. All these different national and tribal uh, groups were at different levels of economic uh, development. And as a result, they had different levels of national development of their national consciousness as well. You had places like Poland, uh, which had had a, a certain period of, of uh, bourgeois development and, an, and a developed national uh, identity. Uh, you had other areas like most of the Caucasus uh, mountain uh, national groups that uh, many of them hadn't, didn't even have a written uh, language. The problem was further complicated because some of these national groups which existed within the Russian Empire had also members of the same national groups living in other countries outside of uh, the empire. And not only this, but also over a, over a long period of time, some of these national groups had parts of the population emigrating to other parts of the Russian uh, Empire. And finally, the, not finally, there was two more factors. One is that the Russian Empire had a deliberate policy of sending great Russian uh, colonists to uh, go and settle in some of the Central Asian uh, lands, which originally were populated by other groups. <laughs> 
And then in other parts, it was economic development, uh, the exploitation of mines, the development of industry that attracted workers, great Russian uh, workers, to other nationalities, uh, where they became uh, the dominant force in the working class in places where the, the, the national group was a different one. So, so the national question in the Russian Empire was extremely complicated. It was, it was a disintegrating factor. But also one, the, the Revolutionary Party had to get right if it wanted if it wanted to carry out a successful revolution in Russia. Because this problem affected mainly uh, the peasant and petty bourgeois masses, which were the majority of the population at that time. It was also, it was also closely linked to the agrarian uh, question. And uh, Trotsky says in uh, his History of the Russian Revolution that had the Bolsheviks not had the correct policy on this question, they could have no, not been uh, victorious. In fact, he says in the History of the Russian Revolution, he says, whatever may be the further destiny of the Soviet Union, The national policy of Lenin will find its place amongst the eternal treasures of mankind. So what was this policy? What did it consist of? Most bourgeois historians of the Russian Revolution uh, have shown their complete inability to understand this policy. And therefore, they draw completely wrong conclusions from uh, it. Like uh, historians like Richard Pipes, for instance, who claims that the Bolshevik policy on the national question was cynical. That is that, yes, during the struggle against the Tsarist uh, autocracy, they promised uh, the right of self-determination, they promised independence to the nationalities. <laughs> but as soon, as soon as they came to power, they implemented a centralist uh, policy. And, and this is completely wrong. And it shows the inability of uh, bourgeois historians to understand a dialectical, uh, the dialectical approach that Lenin had to this question. The question of the nationalities was dealt already in 1903 in the, in the Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. in what later became the very polemic uh, Clause 9 of the program. And the Clause said a number of things. The first one, the first one was that it recognized the right of nations to self-determination. And by this, it meant the right of nations to form their own independent uh, country if they so wished. The article in the, in the party program also recognized uh, the right, the, the necessity to create the greatest autonomy 
i.e. that the local affairs uh, and also affairs relating to uh, the national culture and language should be ad administered at the local uh, level. And it also added uh, the question of language rights, i.e. the right of uh, children to be taught in their own uh, language. And the right, the right of people to address uh, the administration in their own language and be replied in their own language. But at the same time, but at the same time, it also stressed the need for the unity in struggle of the working class. Of the workers in all the different nationalities in the Russian Empire. But also, but also of course, the unity of the workers of the world. But this, in Lenin's view, meant that there should be one social democratic party. Not separate parties. Not a Jewish party, a Ukrainian party, and so on. That is, that the Jewish social democrats, the Latvian social democrats, the Ukrainian social democrats, they should be all part of one party. In explaining, in explaining the party program on this question, Lenin insisted that the Bolsheviks were against nationalism. They were against all nationalism, both the nationalism of the oppressor nation and the nationalism of the oppressed uh, nation. And he, and he explained that their position was mainly a negative position, i.e. that they were against any privileges for any nations and against all oppression. <laughs> and this meant that they were against the privilege of the oppressor nation, which at that point was the only one who had the right to form their own country. But they were also against any attempt of the bourgeois, of the oppressed nation, to acquire their own uh, privileges. And at one point he used the analogy, and at one point he used the analogy with the right of divorce. Which is, which is a democratic uh, right, he said, that if uh, one of the two members of a couple wants to end uh, the marriage, they have the right to do so. However, this does not mean that in all instances we agitate for divorce. And so, therefore, the Bolsheviks did not establish a prior position, a preconceived position about, about the separation of any country. And this is perhaps the most important part. He said that, that the, the right of self-determination is a democratic right, it's not a socialist uh, right. And that therefore, the right of self-determination should always be subordinate to the labor question, to the class uh, question. And that throughout the history of the Bolshevik party, Lenin always explained that the, the, the ad, ad advocacy of the right of the defense of the right of self-determination was the best way 
to guarantee the unity of the working class. Because the unity of different nations within one single because the unity of different nations within one single state could only be voluntarily. Voluntary union. However, this this was approved in the Party Congress in 1903. But this article in the Party Statutes was to provoke lots of polemics over many years, even after the revolution. First of all, first of all, with the Polish Social Democrats led by uh, Rosa Luxemburg. who actually walked out of the party congress when this, uh, when this clause was passed. And Luxembourg's position, I think you are familiar with, was based on the idea that, uh, that the Polish social democrats were fighting against the Polish uh, bourgeois, the nation Polish, uh, Polish bourgeois, And in doing so, they went over a bit. They, they bent the stick too far, if you, if you want. And they were arguing against the independence of uh, Poland. Which was their right to do so. But further than that, they argued that the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party should delete the right of self-determination from its uh, statutes. And, and Lenin said, look, the, the problem here is the following. The main task of the Russian the great Russian social democrats is to fight against our own bourgeois and our own ruling class. And our own ruling class is oppressing the Poles and other nations and therefore we must guarantee and agitate for the right to self-determination. The task of the Polish Social Democrats is slightly different. The task of the Polish Social Democrats is to fight against the Polish uh, bourgeois. And against any attempt to put the national interests of Poland above the, the class interest of the Polish uh, workers. And therefore, it might be that in certain instances, the Polish uh, Social Democrats will advocate for independence. In some other, in some other occasions, it will advocate, they will advocate against. But certainly, the Russian Social Democrats must always defend the right of self-determination. In order to show in order to show the Polish workers and the Polish masses in general that the Russian Social Democrats are not the same as the Russian ruling class. However, Luxembourg's position was not limited to the Polish uh, party. It was also shared after 1915 uh, by a group of uh, people in the Russian uh, party. Oh, I forgot to say, I, I recommend comrades to read the two uh, booklets that uh, Lenin wrote in, polem in polemicizing against uh, Rosa Luxemburg. One which is critical notes on the national question. And the other one which is called on the right of nations to self-determination. <laughs> 
But in 1915, a group of comrades in the Russian party also advocated a, a similar position to uh, Luxembourg's. A group around uh, people like Bukharin, Piatakov, and Radek. who after the beginning of the war had drawn uh, ultra-left conclusions. And they said in the epoch of imperialist uh, domination, there is a strong tendency towards state capitalism within each uh, state. Capitalism is, is unable to grant any democratic reforms. And the, and the only alternative is uh, socialism or barbarism. And the conclusion they drew from this was that the party should abandon any agitation for any democratic demands. <coughs> not only the right of self-determination, but democratic demands in general. <coughs> because, they argued, these democratic demands cannot be granted are impossible under capitalism. Agitating for them will create uh, false illusions. And under socialism, once the workers take power, these demands are useless because they're already superseded by the situation. In, um, I think it's in 1915, in the thesis on the national question, Bukharin wrote, <coughs> The slogan of self-determination is, first of all, utopian, as it cannot be realized within the framework of capitalism. Lenin polemicized against them in a series of letters, and he described them as imperialist ec economists. Referring to the economists, uh, previous polemic in the party, who were people who s were saying that uh, the proletariat should not concern itself with political demands, just economic demands. <coughs> and quite clearly, the, this question of the democratic demands of the oppressed nationalities played an important role in the Russian Revolution, both in February and in October. <coughs> this was the case particularly in Ukraine and Finland, but also, of course, in uh, Poland, in Georgia, and uh, in Central Asia. In 1916, for instance, there had been, uh, there had been an uprising uh, in Central Asia, mainly of the Kyrgyz uh, nations, against conscription into the war. In the period between February and October, there was a lot of agitation again around this question, particularly in Ukraine, in Poland, and in Finland. <coughs> and, uh, and typically, the provisional government did nothing about it. Even though, even though in most of these uh, cases, the national democratic movement was uh, dominated by bourgeois liberals, which were of the same type, more or less, as those who were leading the, the provisional government. The, Octo the October Revolution, very shortly after coming to power, issued the declaration uh, 
of the rights of the peoples of Russia. On November the 19th, which declared very clearly the right of all nations in uh, the Russian Empire to self-determination, meaning the right of independence. <laughs> but of course, you have to understand that in this question, like in any other questions that the Bolsheviks faced when coming to power, this was not a simple, straightforward issue. <clears throat> The whole, the whole issue of the national question became completely enmeshed in the foreign intervention, the civil war, and so on. But within the first few years of the Russian uh, Revolution, this uh, principle was put into practice by the Bolsheviks. Five independent republics were recognized, including the independence of Finland, Latvia, Ukraine, and Georgia. But also, within the Russian um, Federation, 17 different autonomous republics were created. <coughs> Just to, give, just to give some examples, in Finland, the workers' movement was very strong, even before the revolution. In fact, the workers' party had won a majority in the regional uh, parliament, uh, even uh, before the February revolution. And the provisional government of Kerensky made an alliance with, uh, with the Finnish uh, bourgeois against uh, the workers' parties. And tried to suppress the movement. On the 18th of December 1917, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks recognized the independence of Finland. And by January, there was a revolutionary uprising in Finland, in which the workers took power in the main uh, cities. But the problem here was that uh, the problem here was that uh, the, the leaders of the workers' party in uh, Finland wanted to follow a parliamentary road to socialism. And so instead of taking power, they wasted a lot of time convening uh, parliamentary elections, trying to go through that uh, road, which gave time which gave time to the ruling class to get organized. <coughs> they organized white guards. They brought in Swedish volunteers. And they smashed the working class in a brutal civil war. In which, if I'm not wrong, the figure I've seen is that 100,000 uh, workers were killed. And this, and this raised the question of uh, Soviet intervention. There was, there was a big discussion. Rosa Luxemburg, for instance, said, well, this is your self-determination. The right of self-determination means recognizing bourgeois governments that smash the working class revolution. But Lenin replied that this is not the case and that there was no contradiction between recognizing the right of self-determination, which was necessary, and the workers' state 
coming to the aid of workers in other countries, even militarily. And that if this was not the case in Finland, was only because the Bolsheviks had no army at that time. The old Tsarist army had collapsed. People did not want to fight any more wars. The Bolsheviks were still at war with uh, Germany. This is before the Brest-Litovsk uh, peace treaty. So they did not have any forces to intervene. Otherwise, they would have had. In the case of Ukraine, the situation was further complicated. Because while Lenin always insisted that Ukraine was one of the countries which could exercise its uh, right to self-determination, There was, there was strong opposition to that idea from within the party, including prominent Bolshevik leaders in Ukraine, like Pyatakov, who were ultra-lefts on this question. But also in the Donbass, which is the, the mi mining area in the southeast uh, of uh, Ukraine. The, the local Bolsheviks there, which were mainly based on Russian, uh, Russian and other mine workers that emigrated to this uh, industrially rich area to work, were fiercely against any form of Ukrainian nationalism and did not recognize the right of self-determination. <coughs> so if you think about it, that's, that has some relevance for what has happened now in uh, Ukraine. Ukraine, furthermore, had uh, never really existed as an independent uh, country. It was composed of different uh, national groups, but also its uh, territory was also divided between different uh, countries over a period of time. Amongst the most important social classes in the cities, i.e. the workers, the merchants, the small bourgeois, and so on, Ukrainian, Ukrainian speakers were a small minority. Most of the city dwellers were either Great Russian, Jewish, or Poles. Including, of course, Trotsky, who was born in what is now uh, Ukraine. And the, and the Ukrainian speakers were mostly concentrated in the countryside amongst the peasants. And so the national movement had an influence mostly or exclusively amongst a layer of uh, petty bourgeois intellectuals. After February, a Ukrainian uh, Rada was established, the Ukrainian uh, regional uh, government. And at the same time, there was a powerful workers' agitation in the industrial centers, uh, places in places like Kharkov, in uh, Odessa, in Kiev, in the Donbass. Um, in November 19, after the taking of power by, uh, by the Soviets, uh, 
a Ukrainian People's uh, Republic was declared, led by petty bourgeois and bourgeois nationalists. But it did not yet declare independence. At the same time, at the same time, there was a powerful Soviet uh, movement developing in uh, Ukraine. And the bourgeois nationalists that led the Ukrainian People's Republic felt threatened by it. Lenin and the Soviets issued a letter to the Ukrainian People's Republic. in which they reaffirmed the principle of self-determination and they said they were, they were prepared to recognize the independence of uh, the republic if they so uh, wished. But also stressed three points. That they said that the decision had to be taken by the Ukrainian people as a whole Uh, i.e. through a constituent assembly in uh, Ukraine. They also asked the Ukrainian uh, Rada, or People's Republic by this time, that they should also recognize the Soviets that they exi that existed in uh, Ukraine. And they also asked the Ukrainian People's Republic to clarify their position about the activities of counter-revolutionary armies of Kornilov and Kaledin in, in uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, by January 29, the following uh, year, Ukraine declared independence. which the Soviets recognized. But shortly afterwards, there was a Soviet uprising in uh, Ukraine, led by Pyatakov. Which, starting in uh, Kharkov, which was an industrial center, marched all the way to Kiev. And in, very few, in, a very, and in a short space of a few weeks, established a Soviet government in uh, Kiev. The Soviets gained a lot of support also from the peasantry, which was mainly Ukrainian speaking because of their agrarian uh, policy. However, this government only, last, only lasted a few weeks. Because at this time, at this time uh, the, the, the Soviet Republic was still at war with Germany. And during the negotiations in Brest-Litovsk, when the Bolsheviks were trying to gain uh, time, The Germans advanced and took over Ukraine. And they established a German dominated, German puppet government called the Hetmanate. And later, and later when the Germans withdrew, the Rada was reestablished, this time under the protection or as a puppet government of French imperialism. So in reality you see that o over a long period of history Ukraine could only exist as an independent country. either as a Soviet uh, government, 
or not at all? Because all other inde so-called independent uh, Ukrainian governments were in reality puppets of different imperialist uh, powers. In fact, today, Marxists in Ukraine joke that uh, Lenin created Ukraine as an independent country in 1919, and, then, and the Ukrainian nationalists have now destroyed it. And this is quite true. But there were additional problems, not only the problem of imperialist war, but also the civil war. Ukraine was between 1919 and 1921, one of the main scenarios of the civil war. And this was not just, this was not just a civil war between reds and whites. In the Ukraine, there were also the Greens, the Magnoite uh, troops, which fought at different times in different sites of the, of the civil war. There were also a whole number of uh, Ukrainian-based communist uh, groups. For a short period of time, there was also a Soviet Republic in the Donbas. It was really a complete mess for about two years, in which the class struggle and the national struggle com completely overlapped. And this was not the end of the problems in Ukraine, because when the civil war finished in 21, the first head of the Ukrainian uh, Soviet government was Piatakov. who, as we know, was an ultra-left on the national question. Uh, he not only carried a completely careless uh, policy in relation to the national question in, in Ukraine, <laughs> had a very ultra-left policy on the agrarian question as well, which alienated many of the middle layers of the peasantry. After one year, Piatakov was replaced by Rakovsky, the Balkan uh, internationalist. But Rakovsky, at the beginning, also had a wrong position on the national question. He was very strongly influenced by his background in the Balkans and the defense of the slogan of the Balkan Socialist Federation. And he did not pay any attention to the national question in Ukraine. In effect, in effect he had an, a very abstract internationalist uh, position. And in practice, led a campaign of Russification of Ukraine. Now, Lenin was horrified by this. And if you, read, uh, if you read the writings of Lenin between 1918 and 1922 in relation to Ukraine, you will see that he had an extremely careful uh, approach to the Ukrainian national question. And, uh, and he made many concessions to people who you will maybe describe as Ukrainian nationalists in order to reverse the damage that had been done. 
For instance, in Ukraine, the left SRs, the left social revolutionaries, had an organization called Borodba. They were known as the Borodbists. And they, and they basically wanted to join the Communist uh, Party. But in the discussions about the fusion, there were three different uh, positions. Uh, there was one section that wanted uh, the Ukrainian Party, the Ukrainian Communist Party, to be part of the Russian Communist Party. The Partido Comunista Ukrainiano fuera parte del Partido Comunista Ruso. There were others that said that the Ukrainian Communist Party should be separate from the Russian Party. And there were others who argued that not only the Communist Party should be independent, but Ukraine should be independent, should not be part of the Russian uh, Federation. And Lenin, in this debate, he, you, you should really read his writings on this question because it really shows his uh, very careful attitude to the national question. Lenin, in this debate, he insisted in the unity of uh, the working class. But at the same time, he said that questions of uh, demarcation of borders and the relative degree of autonomy of the party were not questions of principle. But should be but should be decided amicably within the Ukrainian party. And he said something something is very important. He said, if a great Russian communist insists upon the amalgamation of the Ukraine with Russia, Ukrainians might easily suspect him of advocating this policy not from the motive of uniting the proletarians in the fight against capital, but because of the prejudices of the old great Russian nationalism of imperialism. And he added, such mistrust is natural and to a certain degree inevitable and legitimate. Because the great Russians, under the yoke of landowners and capitalists, had for centuries imbibed the shameful and disgusting prejudices of great Russian chauvinism. But, but this is not, sorry, but this is not all he said. He added, if a Ukrainian communist insists upon the unconditional state independence of the Ukraine, he lays himself open to the suspicion that that he is supporting this policy not because of the temporary interest of the Ukrainian workers and peasants in their struggle against the yoke of capital, but on account of the petty bourgeois national prejudices of the small owner. Therefore, the, we, great Russian communists, must repress with the utmost severity 
the slightest manifestation in our midst of great Russian nationalism. Because they are, because they are a betrayal of communism in general. They, they cause the gravest harm by dividing us from our Ukrainian comrades. and play into the hands of Denikin and his reactionary regime. So this is Lenin's uh, position. And I have another quote, if I can find it. Oh, here it should be here somewhere. In, 19, in November 1919, the Red Army entered uh, Ukraine. And Trotsky issued an order to the troops. And in the order he said, the Ukraine is the land of the Ukrainian workers and working peasants. The Ukraine is the land of the Ukrainian workers and working peasants. They alone have the right to rule in Ukraine, to govern it, and to build a new life in it. Keep this firmly in mind. Your task is not to conquer the Ukraine, but to liberate it. When the reactionary bands of the Nikin have been smashed, the working people of the liberated Ukraine will themselves decide on what terms they are to live with Soviet Russia. Long live the free and independent Soviet Ukraine. So you see, this was Trotsky's uh, position after the revolution. After the revolution, he was advocating a free Soviet Ukraine to decide freely what relations it should have with Soviet Russia. And this means that, contrary to what the ultra-lefts imagine, the national question, like any other democratic questions, are not automatically resolved the day after the taking of power. On, on the contrary, it takes a very long uh, time and the development of the material conditions for all the national prejudices and ideas to uh, be eradicated. <laughs> including, including the prejudices of the oppressor nation. And this and this applies equally to the struggle for the liberation of women, for the struggle against the influence of religion, and so on. But this debate did not finish with the uh, October Revolution. Uh, they, it continued. Uh, the ultra-lefts, uh, the left-wing communists of Bukharin and so on, they continued to argue against the self-determination. In the Congress of 1919, the 8th Congress, Bukharin, Derzinski, Piatakov, Ordonikidze, and others 
And behind, behind some of this was also Stalin, who took a more or less neutral, uh, or appeared to take a neutral position. They were all against the Brest-Litovsk uh, agreement. Interestingly, interestingly, many of them came from oppressed nationalities, Georgians, Ukrainians. You could say, you could say they had been over-educated in the struggle against their own national bourgeois. And in that Congress, Buharin proposed an amendment to the party program. They, where he said that the right of self-determination should be recognized as the right of self-determination of the working people alone. And Lenin said, this is ridiculous. The, the, the right of self-determination is a democratic right, not a socialist uh, right. And therefore affects the whole nation. You cannot uh, decree away the existence of class, classes within the nation. In another instance, in 1920, the issue of self-determination and military intervention was tested in uh, Poland. In which the Soviet government, the Red Army, made a mistake. Of advancing into Poland militarily with the idea that this would accelerate or provoke a rising of the Polish uh, workers and peasants. For this, for this mistake, uh, Stalin's impatience uh, is to blame or had a big part in it. And this and this is explained in detail in Trotsky's My Life and in Trotsky's uh, Stalin. But the principle here was not that military intervention was ruled out as a matter of principle. But rather, the one cannot impose Soviet power by the force of military intervention. It has to come from within. There has to be a, a genuine uprising of the workers and peasants. And only, one, only once that has happened, of course, the Soviet uh, power in a neighboring country has the right and the duty to help the workers in that country. Another similarly wrong policy was followed in 1920 in Georgia. Georgia if you look at the history of Bolshevism, Georgia was mainly a uh, petty bourgeois nation, dominated by petty bourgeois classes in the city and the countryside. And for this reason, the Mensheviks were always the dominant party. In fact, you could say that the national, the, the, the old Russian uh, Menshevik party had its main base uh, in, in, uh, in Georgia. It was its stronghold. The issue of Georgia was very complex. 
because it uh, it also had to do with uh, with the uh, arrival of with the civil war. Soviet power in the neighboring uh, republics. But the truth is that the Georgian uh, Orzhonikidze was very impatient, had a, a bureaucratic attitude towards uh, uh, imposing revolution in Georgia. And he staged a series of provocations, sent misleading information to the National Center, and with the support of Stalin behind the scenes, created a de facto situation in which the Red Army invaded uh, Georgia and installed uh, Soviet power. Something which led to all sorts of complications, which we will see in a minute. Just to mention, just to mention the policy the Soviets followed in uh, Central Asia, which was a completely different uh, area. Most of these, most of these peoples and national groups were extremely backward. Some of them were nomadic. Most of them did not have a written uh, language. And the national movement in many of these places was dominated by the ideas of, uh, was under the, under the flag of Islam and even pan-Islamism or pan-Turkism. And uh, here in this area and also in the Caucasus, here and in the Caucasus, during the Civil War, the Bolsheviks, uh, as much as it was possible, allied, allied themselves with the progressive uh, modernizing intelligentsia which existed in all these uh, places. And in some cases, these uh, national movements became incorporated into the communist parties. They were won over to the ideas of Bolshevism. Enormous progress was made in these uh, regions. And there are many examples of, uh, of this that I could uh, give. The Bolsheviks proceeded in a very cautious uh, way. For instance, part of the domination of the Russian Empire over these peoples was on the question of uh, religion, language, and the script in which uh, language was to be written. So the, the Tsarist Empire imposed the, the Russian Orthodox Church against, for instance, the Armenian uh, Church and against Islam in many of these uh, peoples. They imposed the Cyrillic script Where, where bourgeois nationalists and progressive reformers in these countries were fighting for the restoration of the, of the Arab script in the uh, script in their languages. And the Bolsheviks reversed this policy completely. 
they uh, allow the freedom of religion they return uh, land and buildings that had been expropriated from the mosques for instance In one case, they returned to the Kazakhs a uh, holy Quran that had been uh, taken into museum in uh, Moscow. And the general progress in the development of the national uh, culture and identity of these peoples was extraordinary. The Bolsheviks implemented a policy in which, through, through of um, education, they said that in every school where there were 25 children in every age group of one particular language group, they should be taught in their own language. not only in the region of origin of this national group, but anywhere where they were settled. By 1924, printing of uh, books, school books, and uh, newspapers was being ca carried out in 24 different uh, languages. There were many discussions about the, the, really the creation of national languages which did not exist. And so, for instance, in, in relation to the Kyrgyz, there was a debate about which dialect should become the, the basis for the modern language. And in this case, instead of using the more dominant dialect that was used in the cities, they adopted, they adopted the dialect that was used in the more rural uh, areas. Uh, because that was the dialect in which uh, epic uh, Kyrgyz uh, poetry, which was the only form of uh, literature, had been spoken. There was also a big debate about the question of the script in which the language should be written. And uh, Lenin and Lunacharsky argued in favor of transforming all languages in Russia into a Latin uh, script. Which was the same position as the uh, Skemal Ataturk had in uh, Turkey for the same uh, reasons, in order to modernize the country, bring it closer to the West. But in this, in this, like in many other questions pertaining to culture, education, and so on, Lenin did not impose his criteria on anyone else. <coughs> and in fact, he said that the decision should be taken by the peoples that affected themselves. And many, and, and many of the Central Asian peoples decided to go for, a, for, a, for an Arab script, those who were Islamic. And all these, uh, <coughs> all these cultural and education policies were accompanied by something that, from the point of view of the Bolsheviks, was even more important. <coughs> 
which was the economic development. There was a conscious policy of investing in, in these countries to develop infrastructure in these nations, to develop infrastructure, industry, and so on, to strengthen the working class. And also a conscious, um, a conscious policy towards, uh, let's say, the nationalization of the local communist parties. That is, the, the communist parties in many of these places were made up only of Russian uh, workers, or mostly of Russian workers. And there was a conscious campaign of recruiting communists from the national group concern. Going to the point, for instance, in some Central Asian uh, republics, the requirement for, for Bolshevik pa Communist Party members to be free from religious prejudice was waived in the case of uh, a number of these peoples who were Muslim. And this led to a massive influx of uh, people from a Muslim uh, background into these uh, parties. And instead, And instead of leading to, let's say, the Islamization of the communists, it led to the sharpening of class struggle inside the mosque. Incidentally, this was the opposite of the policy that then Stalin followed later on. For instance, in 1927, the Genodel, the, the women's organization, started a campaign in Central Asia, or basically a, a campaign of public demonstrations against the wearing of the Islamic scarf by women. in which uh, women were pushed, were pressurized in public assemblies to uh, take off the scarf. By the force of propaganda. And this did not work. In fact, it backfired. In fact, what happened was that uh, these women who had taken this step were isolated in the local communities. Uh, families withdrew their girl children from uh, the schools. And the policy had to be reversed. And this shows that in reality, in this kind of matters, there is only limited amount that you can do through propaganda. And the majority of the work has to be done through economic uh, development, the incorporation of people into education, and so on. You have to think that at the time of the revolution, the, the level of literacy uh, in these regions was maybe 2 or 5 percent. Uh, even, even with a very remote nomadic people in the north and in the far east, 
The policy of the Bolsheviks was extremely careful. For instance, the Yakuts, a very small uh, tribal group, nomadic tribal group in the north, were given for the first time a written language in the Latin script, which had no, um, no punctuation marks and no capitals. which sounds like a good idea. Um, the final point. Oh, I want to mention something, if I can find the quote. No, I can't find it. Maybe um, sorry. Uh, there is another quote I found. It says, "This is a, a declaration from 1917." The quote I was looking for is from the Baku Congress of the Peoples of the East, but maybe I'll, I'll give it in my uh, summing up. But on the 24th of November, 17, the Soviet government issued a declaration to all the Muslim workers of Russia and the East. And it said the following, Muslims of Russia, all of you whose mosques and prayer houses have been destroyed, whose beliefs and customs have been trampled upon by the czars and oppressors of Russia, your beliefs and practices, your national and cultural institutions are forever free and inviolate. You shall know that your rights, like those of all the peoples of Russia, are under the pro mighty protection of the revolution. They even, they even, this is not commonly known, they even uh, allowed the functioning of Sharia courts in these uh, regions. For the resolving of uh, small civil uh, matters and conflicts, as long as they were not in contradiction with general Soviet law, for instance, on women's rights and other things like that. And then we come to the last point, because uh, this uh, very careful national policy of Lenin was not only completely destroyed and reversed under Stalin, But in fact, the beginning of Lenin's struggle against the bureaucratization of the Soviet Union and against Stalin was on the question of the national question. There were two points in this struggle. The first one in 1922. First one in 1922 when they were discussing the form that the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was going to take, the legal form. And uh, Stalin had one position, 
you have to remember that through, through this period, Stalin was the head of the, the, it was the People's Commissar for Nationalities. And Stalin phrased the Constitution in the following terms. He talked. He talked of the entry of Ukraine into the Russian Socialist uh, Soviet Federative Republic. And, and, uh, and Lenin insisted this is not to be in this way. It is not that Ukraine is joining Russia. He says, he says that the, 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 the Constitution should read the formal unification with the Russian Socialist Federative so, uh, Soviet Republic in a union of Soviet republics, a the formal unification. He said, the formal unification with the Russian Federation into a union of Soviet republics. He said, I hope, and Lenin said, I hope the meaning of this concession is clear. We consider ourselves, the Ukrainian Soviet so Socialist Republic, and others, equal, and enter with them on equal basis into a new union, a new federation, the Union of Soviet Republics of Europe and Asia. This debate was in 1922, and Lenin described Stalin as having a quasi-imperialist attitude towards oppressed nationalities. And in this struggle, in the debates, Lenin was supported by people like uh, Mykola Spripnik, who was the leader of the Ukrainian uh, uh, Bolsheviks. Who was himself uh, a linguist and had played a key role in uh, standardizing the alphabet and the orthography of Ukrainian for the first time. Uh, this Spripnik then became a Stalinist uh, bureaucrat and, and was purged by Stalin in 1934, I think. 33. Uh, Lenin also had the support of Trotsky, Rakovsky, and others in this uh, debate. Lenin also added. If you scratch a communist, in many cases you will find a Russian chauvinist. But the main incident was in 1923. 1923. There was an incident in which it was found out that in a debate in, in Georgia, Or Jonokidze had punched a, a Georgian nationalist in the face. Lenin was completely furious. He demanded the expulsion of Or, or, or Jonokidze from the party. But he said the real responsible for this were Stalin and Dzerzhinsky. And he wrote a series of letters, his contribution to the problem of the nations or on the question of autonomization. 
in which he starts by saying, I think that I have incurred in a, grave, in a great mistake before the workers of Russia for not having strongly, uh, not having spoken strongly and harshly enough about this question before. And these are very interesting letters, but I'd like to give maybe just one or two quotes from it. It says, in, me, in my other works about the national question I have already written, that the abstract, uh, that raising the problem of nationalism in general and in abstract is completely useless. <laughs> it is necessary to distinguish between the nationalism of the oppressor nation and the nationalism of the op oppressed nation. Regarding the second nationalism, we, the members of a great, uh, of a big nation, almost always are guilty of committing in the practical terrain of history infinite acts of violence and even more we commit them without realizing infinite acts of violence and offense. And he, and he concludes, for this reason, the internationalism of the oppressor nation must consist not only in observing formal equality between the nations, but also in implementing certain inequality, which in the, on the part of the oppressor nation would compensate the real inequality that takes place in life. We need something beyond equal forma, uh, formal equality. We need to compensate in one way or another with our treatment or with concessions to other nations the mistrust, prevention, and aggravations committed in the historical past by the government of the, of the dominant nation. And he's saying this, he insists, he's saying this not because he is in favor of the nationalism of the oppressed nation, but because this is the only way to achieve the maximum degree of unity and trust between the workers of both nations. Lenin uh, unfortunately died in 1924. He could not conclude this uh, struggle. In 1924 is also the year of uh, socialism in one country, introduced by uh, Stalin. But it's also worth mentioning that uh, at the beginning, Stalin's policy was not one of immediate reversal of the national uh, policy of Lenin. <laughs> 
But on the contrary, he pretended to continue this policy. And he followed a policy which he described as uh, Korenizatia, which means the indigenization or the nationalization of the communist parties in the republics. Many of these were positive uh, measures which were a continuation of Lenin's uh, policy. But, but also had a certain uh, element, which was never present in uh, Lenin, of, um, if you want, nation building or, or developing nationalism in, in such a way. But by 1933-34, the whole policy was reversed. This was the period uh, in, in Ukraine, it was reversed before. This was the period of the failure of uh, collectivization, forced collectivization. And the beginning of the period which led to the purges. And it's quite clear and it's quite clear the the purges, Stalinist purges, had a particular, particularly harsh impact on all the nationalities. For instance, during the purges, all members of the Tajik uh, Communist Party Central Committee were eliminated. In Ukraine, nine-tenths of all Stalinist officials in the, with the heads of departments, the ministers, all the high officials were either arrested, deported, or, or killed in the purges. And it is also in some of these nationalities that the opposition was stronger. And this was the case particularly in Ukraine, in the industrial centers, in Kharkov, uh, amongst the communist youth, in the big factories. As it's very well explained in uh, Bruet's book, Communists Against Stalin. which is on sale in Italian at the Italian uh, stall. Uh, the, this was a return to a wholesale policy of great Russian uh, nationalism, which was the same policy as the Tsarist Empire. The Cyrillic script was imposed on all of these uh, nations, which had previously chosen either the Latin or the Arabic script. And as you know, this, the, uh, nation, uh, the, the Stalin's policy of national uh, oppression, Played, played also a big, created uh, enormous accumulated uh, grievances that remained for decades. During the Second World War, we had the mass deportation of whole uh, peoples who were branded as being uh, collaborators. And this, had, and this had an impact in the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, which from a formal point of view started with a referendum on independence in Ukraine, not, not by chance. <laughs> 
And if you look, for instance, at um, the brutal suppression of Russia, the capitalist state of Russia, against the Chechens, for instance, you will see that, in fact, the Chechens and the Ingush, uh, two peoples in the Caucasus, were amongst the most loyal and brave fighters for the Soviet Republic during the Civil War. On the basis that the national uh, culture and the national rights had been fully recognized and uh, they felt so by uh, the Soviet government. Now, now, on the contrary, Ch Chechnya is a hotbed of uh, Islamic uh, reactionary fundamentalism. So I would say that the policy of the, of the Bolshevik revolution towards the national question is uh, an extremely rich heritage and proud heritage that we should reclaim. And explain fully, because it's not commonly uh, known other than in generalities, And also, it contains very, very many lessons which are on how to deal with a national question, which are strikingly, strikingly relevant for our uh, attitude today. As uh, Marx and Lenin uh, said, one nation cannot be free that oppresses another nation. And uh, the other side of the coin of this uh, important principle is workers of the world unite. And the two are inextricably linked. Because, because you can only achieve the unity of workers of different nations, different religious and ethnic uh, backgrounds if you eliminate, if you, if you guarantee democratic rights and eliminate any vestige of oppression. <laughs>